Thank you again. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dave DeMille, uh, University of Chicago. Um, <clears throat> Dave is a pioneer in the use of atoms and molecules for precision measurements of fundamental physics, uh, as well as being a resource for quantum science. Uh, his current research is focused on molecules uh, and centers around using uh, precision measurements to search for fundamental symmetry violations uh, in both the electrons and the nuclei in molecules, uh, as well as direct laser cooling to reach ultra cold temperatures uh, to access quantum phenomena. Uh, Dave is a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, he's won the Francis M. Pipkin and Norman F. Ramsey prizes, uh, as well as a number of others. Um, and Dave was also a, a, co a mentor for me in graduate school. So it's a great honor for me to introduce him. Um, let's all join in welcoming Dave. Yeah, so thanks for the nice introduction, Nick. Uh, yeah, as Nick said, I sort of, you know, grabbed him to be his mentor at Caltech or at, at Harvard when he was a student just because it was so fun to work with him. So it's always, always fun to catch up and hear what he's up to. Um, but uh, yeah, as Nick said, I'll be talking today about our uh, experiments using polar molecules and in particular moving towards use, doing experiments with ultra cold polar molecules, by which I mean temperatures you know, below the regime that you can get with, with macroscopic refrigerators. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, why this would be interesting and you know for both ultra cold, but also cold, meaning cryogenic temperature of molecules. Um, and then talk about ongoing experiments using merely cold molecules to probe CP violation beyond a standard model, and very, very, very closely related uh, to what Nick's working on here. Uh, and then, then talk about you know what seems to be the future, which is uh, making molecules ultra cold, and then using those ultra cold molecules to probe. Uh, even more deeply for, for beyond standard model physics. Uh, so I know when I was an undergrad and even a grad student, I never learned anything about molecules. So they sort of pushed out of the, the physics curriculum because it was understood, even by our shallow, that a diatomic molecule has one atom too many. Um, <laughs> uh, so why, why are they so complicated? Well, you know, in atomic physics, we have atoms, they have, you can excite the electron orbital, let's say from a ground S orbital to an excited P orbital with energy scales of order EV to do that. But, you know, when you bring the atoms close enough together, they can form molecular bonds, uh, and then there are molecular potential energy curves uh, that correspond to those bound molecules. Uh, so that's already a little more complicated than, than atoms. Uh, but if you zoom in here, of course, the, the potential wells come with uh, lots of vibrational structures. The vibrational energy splittings are of order, typically of order around 10 to the minus 2 EV. And there are many more internal states associated with this vibrational degree of freedom. And then if you zoom in even further, you see the molecules have rotational structure. Uh, where the energy splittings are on typically on the order of 10 to the minus 5 EV or, or even less in some cases. Um, so there's the extra degrees of freedom associated with the vibration and rotation really make molecules much more complicated and difficult to deal with in atoms. So why, why are people like me and Nick going to all the trouble to do this? And in many cases, it's related to the fact that polar molecules can have electric dipoles. So it's a little surprising if your only knowledge of molecules is from chemistry to, to understand that a molecule in free space, not interacting with anything else, uh, in an energy eigenstate, such as the J equals zero vibrational electronic ground state, but rotational angular momentum zero state, even if it's a polar molecule, that state has no net dipole and the reason is pretty obvious from this you know looking at this wave function the the probability that the molecule points this way and that way are the same 
or this way and that way are the same. There's no, no preferred direction. And therefore, there can't be a net electric dipole moment in this because the dipole moment's of energy. It's a point in some direction. And the same is true for excited states like this J equals one state. Uh, these are analogous, closely analogous to S states and P states that we know and love in hydrogen atom, for example, for the electrons in an atom. But this is denoting the rotation of, let's say, a light atom in a molecule around a heavy atom in a molecule. Um, but if you subject these molecules to an electric field, then you know undergraduate quantum mechanics says that this electric field will mix these states of opposite parity, the S and P states. And it's very easy to visualize that if you make a superposition of this wave function where the magenta indicates a, a negative sign and the red indicates a positive sign of the wave function, if you make one superposition of these here, for example, There'll be destructive interference on one side of the molecule, constructive on the other. Or if you make the superposition with a minus sign, you get destructive interference on the other end of the molecule. And here we get back to the sort of high school chemistry picture of what a polar molecule looks like. Uh, you know, a charge falls on the end of some kind of stick. Um, and the ground state of the molecule, as you would imagine, polarizes in, in the natural way. So this dipole moment points along the electric field that you've used to polarize it. But it's also quite interesting and useful that the first excited state of the molecule polarizes in the wrong direction in the sense that its dipole moment points opposite the direction of the electric field. Um, and that's, uh, that's the energy eigenstate. It's not the ground state, uh, obviously, but uh, still it's a perfectly fine stable quantum state. So in many ways, a lot of the interest in, in using cold and ultra-cold molecules for various types of experiments is directly related to the small energy splittings between rotational states or other states of, of opposite parity because they allow full electric polarization with a direction that's selectable, either by changing the electric field direction or by changing the internal state of the molecule. So this is kind of a new degree of freedom that's completely absent in atoms. So why, why do we work so hard to make molecules cold? And the answer is in part because of this extra complexity of internal states. Uh, even at cryogenic temperatures, typically molecules have a Boltzmann distribution that populates many different quantum states, rotational states, uh, and other internal states. This is compared to atoms where the first excitations are often, often at the EV scale and thermally only one state is populated. So if you can cool this internal degrees of freedom, you can collect your sample of molecules into a single quantum state of the internal degrees of freedom. But uh, if you're, especially if you're interested in doing precision measurements, if you can also cool the center mass motion of the molecule, uh, let's say you're trying to do a spectroscopic measurement uh, at room temperature with atoms and molecules, these are usually limited by Doppler widths due to thermal motion. But uh, if you're colder, you can narrow up this Doppler distribution uh, and essentially get better energy resolution in spectroscopic measurements. Um, and if you cool the center of mass motion sufficiently, then uh, you can use electromagnetic fields to track the molecules which allows you to have longer observation times, uh, even better energy resolution, and you're more sensitive to various weak effects on the molecules that might be interested. So there's been a drive over the last 20 to 25 years in the atomic physics community to start applying cooling techniques to molecules for all these reasons. Uh, and, and, you know, what we found is that new phenomena and types of control really emerge at, at each temperature range, you know, basically every, every three decades of temperature or something really new or um, So a large part of the field is interested in uh, various types of few body or many body physics with molecules. Again, the idea is if you have some gas of polar molecules, you apply an electric field, you can polarize them. And then the interactions between these polarized molecules are electric dipole dipole interactions, 
which compared to the Van der Waals interactions between atoms are radically stronger and longer range and also anisotropic because it depends on the orientation of the dipoles relative to each other. You can tune it by turning, turning the polarization of molecules on and off by the strength of the electric field. So this is really completely different from interactions between atoms. Um, and there have been lots of lots of ideas for this, you know, I would say for what to do with this starting now 20 plus years ago with an idea that I, I developed for using optically trapped molecules as qubits in a large scale quantum computer. This has now started to first come to fruition in the last couple of years in the groups of Lawrence Chuck and John Doyle uh, at Princeton and Harvard respectively, where they've been able to basically demonstrate quantum two qubit quantum gates between individual polar molecules trapped in a tweezer, optical tweezers. So that's that's an interesting development that's still unfolding in the field. Uh, there was lots of excitement about doing quantum simulation of strongly correlated quantum many body systems by employing the long range dipole dipole interactions between molecules trapped in optical lattices, for example. And this is now really starting to come to fruition. Uh, now, a couple of groups uh, have been able to make degenerate Fermi gases of polar molecules. And just last week, the first announcement of a Bose condensate of polar molecules was, was published by a group from Columbia. So this is gonna be a big new trend in, in many body physics with, with ultrapole particles, now molecules instead of atoms to enter this new regime of really strongly correlated systems. Um, and then there's also been a lot of interest in studying chemical reactions at low temperatures where a lot of the dynamics of chemical reactions are quite qualitatively different than they are at higher temperatures. Um, as Nick said, my interests are more focused these days on doing precision measurements with polar molecules. Here we don't, we're not so, not taking advantage so much of the dipole-dipole interactions between molecules, but rather taking advantage of the fact that the rotational and other internal motions uh, give nearly degenerate energy levels or close energy levels that can be, that have a greater sensitivity to perturbations. Um, so, you know, we've got, we and, and now many other groups in the field are, are using polar molecules to study CP violation in the guise of electric dipole moment of the electron or uh, some features of the standard model that haven't been measured in other ways through parity violation uh, or looking for variations of fundamental constants like the electron and proton mass ratio. So this, is, this has really been a, a big development in the field over the last 20 years or so. Um, as I'll mention, the current generation of experiments that are doing these precision measurements, testing fundamental physics with molecules are using cryogenic temperature molecular beams, uh, but there are potentially very big improvements if we can employ cooling and trapping to do higher precision spectroscopy, as I mentioned before. Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit about one example of these precision measurements uh, where, uh, we, in, including several collaborating colleagues, have been searching for, for now over 15 years for the electron's electric dipole moment. Um, as I'll explain, the electron can acquire an electric dipole moment uh, through radiative corrections involving loops of new particles beyond the standard model. Um, and if it acquires that electric dipole moment associated with these new new particles. Um, you can kind of visualize it as an electron with an asymmetric charge distribution along its spin axis. If you then subject that electron to a big electric field, that electric field will produce a torque on the electric dipole moment, uh, but the torque is, or the dipole moment is attached to the spin axis, so like a gyroscope, that torque will cause the spin to process around the electric field. And the reason molecules are interesting to do these sorts of experiments is that inside a polar molecule, for example, thorium oxide, an electron in, you know, bound inside that molecule can feel an electric field that's absolutely gigantic. In the case of thorium oxide molecules, it's about 80 gigavolts per centimeter. 
So this is, you know, roughly six orders of magnitude bigger electric field than you could apply in a lab by putting voltages on, on electrodes. Because if you try to go higher, the electrodes just are. So this, the gigantic electric fields inside molecules have, have provided a lot of leverage to look for electric dipole moments of the electron and, and soon other particles. So uh, as I mentioned, the electric dipole moment uh, of an electron, uh, it actually can appear in the standard model. It does appear, but at a level that's suppressed by many, many orders of magnitude due to some symmetries of the standard model. By contrast, in, in models that add new particles, new fields, new, new interactions, new degrees of freedom beyond those in the standard model, it's, it's actually quite easy to generate electric dipole moments. Here's an example in, in the simplest supersymmetric uh, models where an electron can couple to a selectron, this, its supersymmetric partner, and a photino, the, the SUSY partner of a photon. Um, while while this is happening, these can interact with, a, with an ordinary photon. If there's some CP violation denoted by this cross here uh, in, the, in the interactions of these selectrons with a vacuum, when this recombines, the net effect is, is uh, an electric dipole moment of the electron. And with this picture, you can write a sort of dimensional estimate for how big an electric dipole moment you would see. Uh, basically, there's the natural scale is a Bohr magneton times a factor of alpha over two pi to the n, where n is the number of loops in this diagram. This is a single loop diagram. And then it scales like the square of the ratio of electron mass to the mass of the heaviest particles that appear in this loop. And this is a CP violating effect and it requires some sort of CP violating phase associated with the new physics to create an electron EDM. Um, so if, if you plug in numbers uh, with this sort of dimensional estimate, um, including the fact that the only CP violating phase we know in nature is about a radian, we assume other phases could be about as big, that new particles couple to electrons, you know, not, not less than electromagnetic coupling strength. If the new particle in this loop were as heavy as 30 TeV, then that could lead to an electric dipole moment that's about the same as the current limit. So another way to think about that is that experiments like this are sensitive to the existence of new particles uh, with a mass of, of up to around 30 TeV or even higher in certain models. And for comparison, you know, direct searches for new particles at the Large Hadron Collider are typically now probing you know, scales of a couple of TeV. Depends on the type of particle, but you know, maybe one, even three TeV is close to the to limit of what can be ruled out at the LHC. So these experiments are EDM experiments are already probing energy scales in order of magnitude higher than what can be reached directly at the LHC. And as I'll argue, it looks like the field is poised to push this much further to increase sensitivity by many orders of magnitude and therefore increase the, the energy scales being probed by very large factors. Okay, so that's pretty interesting. How do you do experiments like this? The concept is very simple. Let's say you start with some electrons. Nature is unkind, they're unpolarized. Typically, experiments of this type use transfer of the polarization of laser light via some optical pumping process to spin polarize the electrons. For example, suppose we polarize them sideways, which is a coherent superposition of spin up and spin down. For technical reasons, we almost always apply a magnetic field perpendicular to the spin axis that exerts a torque on the magnetic dipole moment, causes the spin of the electron to process around the magnetic field axis uh, at some frequency, uh, at the Larmor frequency. That's entirely equivalent to saying that there's an energy splitting between spin up and spin down in the magnetic field. And that energy splitting H bar omega uh, is, uh, well, it's the same as the H bar omega here because they're the same phenomenon in different language. And you can imagine doing some sort of magnetic resonance measurement and thinking of measuring this energy splitting in terms of some sort of spectral line. 
Um, to look for an EDM, we apply an electric field parallel to the magnetic field. If the electron has an electric dipole moment, that will cause the spins to process faster, or equivalently, the, the up-down spin splitting to be a little bit bigger, or equivalently cause this spectral line to shift over towards higher frequencies. Uh, and then we reverse the electric field and look, look to see the splitting get smaller and the spectral line to, to shift in the opposite direction. Uh, and then we start flipping the electric field back and forth, back and forth, for as long as we can to look for correlated changes uh, in, the, in the spectral line frequency. And with this, it's very easy to write a, a simple figure of merit for the statistical sensitivity of an EDM experiment. It's just the energy shift divided by the energy resolution. Energy shift is dipole moment times electric field. Uh, energy resolution is one over the spin coherence time uh, divided by the signal to noise in the experiment. And the standard quantum limit for this says that the figure of merit is proportional to the square root of the number of molecules, which is the square root of the count rate times the total time of the experiment times the spin coherence time times the size of the electric field. So basically in this business, a big part of the game is to maximize this figure of merit by having more molecules with longer spin coherence times in larger electric fields. Uh, the total integration time is a constant nature limited by how long graduate students are willing to sit in the basement and flip the electric field back and forth. So anyone who has clever ideas for how to improve that would be all ears. So the experiment that I've mentioned a couple of times now, the ACME experiment has now gone through two generations. And up until last year, these two generations had, had produced the best limits on the electron EDM. Uh, and it actually improved the sensitivity to the electron EDM by a factor of 100 within you know, less than a decade. Uh, so here are the elements that go into the statistical figure merit, statistical sensitivity figure merit, coherence time of about a millisecond, this effective field inside the molecule about 80 gigavolts per centimeter, and counting rates in ACME2 of about 10 to the 7 molecules per second. That all, all added up to being, being having a sensitivity that allowed us to not see an EDM. Unfortunately, nature wasn't kind enough to make the EDM large enough for us to see with this experiment. But we were able to set an upper limit that it's less than about 1 times 10 to the minus 29 in units of electron charge centimeters. Remember, a dipole moment is a charge times a distance. And these are the bizarre units the field chooses to use. Uh, but again, this was about a factor of 100 better than the limits prior to the, the beginning of ACME through 2014. So this, is, this has been you know, a big stimulus to the field, the idea that using this big electric field of molecules and new techniques to control the molecules uh, have, have allowed this giant leap forward. Um, and just to give you a sense of this, this was a plot that was taken from a lovely review paper about a decade ago now from Jonathan Feng at UC Irvine, who was discussing the idea of naturalness in theories of physics beyond the standard model, and in particular in supersymmetric models. And he made this plot that showed in a very crude way with lots of loopholes and caveats, but in a, in a broad stroke way, uh, the limits on superpartner mass masses for the different supersymmetric counterparts of standard model particles. And on this scale, the two heaviest standard model particles, the Higgs boson and the top quark are here. Uh, at the time of this review, the LHC put limits at the lower blue lines on different types of particles. And a couple of years ago, I updated this uh, to the best of my ability to show how the limits from the LHC had improved in you know, the intervening seven or eight years. Uh, and, and you can see they've improved by a factor of a couple to three over those years. And you know, in the years since then, they've improved by less than a factor of two generally. So the, these upper blue lines give you a sense of what the LHC has ruled out in terms of masses of supersymmetric particles. The purple, purple shows you uh, what was ruled out by the first generation of ACME. Those are the bottom lines. And then by the second generation, or sorry, this, is, this was before ACME. This is first generation ACME. 
And then second generation ACME pushed up to probing scales in certain cases as high as 30 TeV. Uh, so you can see in, in many of these cases, these have pushed well beyond the mass scale that made sense for a theory that naturally explained the electroweak hierarchy. Uh, so um, that's quite interesting. It means that these EDM experiments are really pushing into a space that's beyond where the expectation of new physics would be, uh, in some cases, by large factors. Um, we're continuing with ACME. Here's the, the latest round of collaborators in ACME 3, including Nick, uh, who's actively participating in ACME, and the three original PIs, myself, John Doyle from Harvard, Jerry Gabriels from Northwestern, and then new collaborators from Okayama University, uh, led by Taka Masuda. Um, in ACME 3, it's very similar to ACME 2, but with a number of pretty major improvements. Uh, for example, we've installed a molecular lens so that we, we keep the molecular beam from diverging to get much higher statistics. Uh, we realize that we can increase the spin coherence time by about a factor of five by lengthening our uh, interaction region. Uh, our Japanese collaborators have, have done great work in developing more efficient photo detectors uh, for the laser-induced fluorescence that we detect in our measurements a variety of different technical improvements. And the bottom line is we're anticipating really these days about a factor of 30 improved sensitivity versus ACME 2 um, sometime within the next two-ish years. Um, and just to give you a sense, this is really happening. You know, we've assembled and tested all the major new subsystems, electrostatic lens, we verified our our the state where we do the measurements has a sufficiently long lifetime, installed new and much better magnetic shielding, uh, develop more efficient photo detectors, uh, and so on. So, you know, the summary for ACME is we're on course for about a factor of 30 improved statistical sensitivity, and we're, we're now uh, starting to install all the subsystems together into the total experiment. We've also done a lot of work controlling the most important known imperfections that would lead to systematic errors. And we've demonstrated that they're under control at the relevant level. Um, and yeah, I expect certainly within the year we'll be have everything together and start doing at least preliminary data taking. Um, and if we're if we reach the target sensitivity, then uh, we'll be probing scales well above 100 TeV in in many models of physics beyond the standard model. Um, so also wanted to point out in this plot that I showed before, most of these purple things are from ACME, uh, ACME 2. Uh, a group at JILA uh, just a few months ago published a result where they improved the limits on the EDM using a different molecule, uh, molecular ion, by a factor of about two. So their limits would push these purple things up you know, by a, by a small bit. But this purple uh, exclusion region is not, not produced by ACME, but rather by experiments looking not at the EDM of the new, of the electron, but rather, uh, well, what you can think of as the electric dipole moment of a nucleus. Uh, and in particular, either looking for the electric dipole moment of a neutron or looking at the electric dipole moment of a mercury nucleus inside a mercury atom. Uh, so uh, this, this is also setting important limits in the hadronic sector as, as opposed to the leptonic sector, mostly from the electron EDM. Um, so we've, we've now been developing a new experiment called Centrex, where the idea is to make better measurements of this uh, effectively nuclear electric dipole moment, but using the same tricks we use for ACME. Um, so the, the idea is that if the nucleus is embedded in a polar molecule uh, as, com as compared to an atom like a mercury atom, 
the effective electric field acting on on the nucleus is about 10 to the four times larger. So that's a big enhancement from using molecules instead of atoms. That's why we go to all the trouble. Um, and in this case, the thallium nucleus basically has an unpaired proton. So we're mostly sensitive to the proton electric dipole moment here. And it's sort of orthogonal to, to neutron or mercury helium experiments. Um, so the goal of Centrex is really for the for the first time in many decades to use a molecular enhancement to improve sensitivity to hadronic CP violation, uh, new interactions above the TEV scale. So here's a, a crude schematic of how Centrex will work. You'll notice it looks a whole lot like how the schematic of ACME, and that's no accident. We're using many of the same techniques. Um, the we've constructed most of the most of the parts of this and tested many of those um and this is being put together in in our labs at argon national lab and we're shooting to you know slightly exceed the present sensitivity of the mercury and neutron edm experiments within the next two-ish years so um and again, you know, just to show you, this is real stuff. Here's some pieces of Centrex, electrostatic lens, microwaves uh, to cool the rotational internal motion, um, three meter long glass electrodes machined to a special shape, um, lots of ultraviolet laser systems, custom magnetic shielding, and so on. Um, so, so yeah, uh, be on the lookout for new results on the proton EDM within the next couple of years from Centrix. So uh, the, the experiments that are looking for the electron EDM or nuclear EDMs in the, in the, using AMO techniques. Now, the ACNE experiment, this latest experiment from Jilla using trapped molecular ions, uh, this experiment using mercury atoms in vapor cells, it's really striking to most AMO experimentalists that these experiments, they've been going on for a long time, all of them now well over 10 years. All of them are, are trying to install upgrades uh, and are going to make significant further progress, most likely. Um, but none of these uses laser cooling or optical trapping, which is shocking. In AMO, everything uses laser cooling. It's, it's step one when you start a lab, except for these precision measurements. And, you know, this gives us hope that by using laser cooling and trapping, we can really get improved energy sensitivity uh, using molecules for these sorts of experiments. And now many groups, including Nick's group and our group, are, are pursuing this road of, of getting molecules that are much colder than cryogenic temperatures to make improved EDM measurements. Um, so how do you make molecules at ultra cold temperatures, by which I mean well below a millikelvin? Um, and ultimately, hopefully, even nanokelvin scale temperatures. There are two approaches. One is to do some chemistry that gives you the molecules you're interested in and then cool the molecules. And the other approach is to cool atoms and then stitch them together to make the molecules you're interested in. And I'll say a little about both of these. First, about making molecules and then cooling them. So laser cooling molecules is, is actually much harder than laser cooling of atoms. And the critical feature is in order to do laser cooling, you need to scatter many, many photons off a part because the momentum of a photon is small and the momentum of an atom or molecule is, is big. So typically you need to scatter something like 10 to the fifth or more photons to, to cool and trap anything. Um, in an atoms like alkali atoms or in principle, hydrogen atoms even, it's simple. You just drive a transition from the ground S state orbital to an excited P state orbital. And that state can only decay back to where it started. And then you just keep doing it over and over again as fast as you can. Uh, with molecules, you can imagine doing the same thing. Um, if you start from the rotational ground state, then that rotational excited state will decay to two different rotational states. That's a little annoying, but if you have two lasers, you can overcome that. Um, but what you can overcome is the fact that there are many vibrational states in the molecule 
And a typical molecule, if you every time you scatter a photon, uh, you'll with probability that's big enough to matter, you'll populate many, many vibrational states. And it just looked intractable for, for a long time. But what was realized back in the early 2000s and then experimentally demonstrated first in our group uh, back around 2010 was that there are certain molecules for which the decays to excited vibrational states are sufficiently low probability that by adding you know, only two more lasers, you can scatter the requisite number of molecules to, to laser cool and trap them. And this was the first example with strontium fluoride. This has now been done with a large handful of different molecular species. Um, um, the issue with the rotational states you can also fix, so you don't need two times as many lasers. If instead of starting from the lowest rotational state with angular momentum j equals zero, you start from the first excited rotational state and drive transitions to the j equals zero state, here selection rules protect you so that this state can only decay back to this rotational state. You can still decay to different vibrational states, but at least you reduce the number of lasers by a factor of two compared to a naive expectation. Um, this causes the problem that this state can decay to different Zeeman sublevels, uh, which aren't addressed by any single laser polarization. But there are various tricks you can use, applying magnetic fields to, to mix the spin states or switching the laser polarizations uh, that allow you to, to make this work, uh, to scatter many photons with only a couple of lasers. Um, it does come with various problems. So for example, when you have this rotational branching structure and vibrational branching, uh, you slow down the rate at which you scatter photons because you keep getting stuck in all these many uh, ground state levels. Uh, and the bottom line is the forces are reduced by typically factors of four to five versus the forces in atoms which makes everything with molecules harder. You need more lasers, the forces are weaker. Um, it's harder to make them. They have to start out cryogenic. Um, uh, and starting out cryogenic, there is a huge development in, in the field driven by John Doyle's group, and no small part by Nick when he was a grad student, uh, in developing cryogenic molecular beings that are slow enough and cold enough to, to make laser cooling and, and precision measurements work. Um, so bottom line, we were able to learn how to do laser cooling, slowing, and trapping uh, with these strontium fluoride molecules, you know, starting with the very first laser cooling in 2010, uh, magneto optical trapping in 2014. Um, and now this has sort of exploded as a, as a subfield of ammo physics. There's now, I don't know, well over a dozen groups working to laser cool and trap many different molecular species, including, of course, Nick here at Caltech. Uh, several, several groups have managed to get the molecules down to tens of microkelvin temperatures and trapped in conservative traps, like optical dipole traps. Uh, John Doyle's group and Lawrence Chuck at Princeton have demonstrated making arrays of individual molecules in tweezers uh, and John Doyle's group has also demonstrated laser cooling of polyatomic species, which, you know, cooling a diatomic was considered, you know, a fantasy 20 years ago, and cooling a polyatomic was not even a fantasy. It's just completely unthinkable. Um, so it's kind of remarkable that this is going forward. Um, and the latest results from our group is we've managed to develop a new technique to load more molecules at higher density into an optical trap. Density is now high enough that we can see molecule-molecule collisions. Here we see inelastic collisions that cause the decay to be uh, double exponential, first driven by collisions and later by other loss mechanisms. Um, and this is, this is an important benchmark. It means we have enough density to see molecule collisions which is necessary to do evaporative cooling, which is necessary to make a Bose Einstein condensated molecules. Uh, so I predict that within the next couple of years, there's going to be several groups that are making Bose condensates and molecules that were later cooled and trapped.
Um, okay, so there's been a lot of interest in which molecular species do you want to use for next generation EDM experiments? Um, and the requirements for the species that you want to use, you want a large electric field, which ends up requiring a large atomic number Z of one of the atoms in the molecule. You need molecules that are easily polarized uh, by an electric field. You need molecules that have their electron orbitals of the right symmetry. Um, and you need, they have to be molecules that you can make ultra cold. Not all molecules can scatter a lot of photons. Um, but nonetheless, this is, this is now a very vibrant area of the field. Uh, groups trying to use very, various different molecular species to do electron EDM experiments based on laser cooled and or trapped molecules. Of course, including a lot of the pioneering work done, done here in Nick's group. Uh, with various different potential species. Uh, so this is, this is an exciting development, but I'm gonna tell you about a different way of doing this that we're embarking on. And it's really based on the fact that the, the most advanced, best way to make ultra cold molecules now is to assemble them by laser cooling and trapping two atoms and binding them together to form a molecule, which sounds insane, but it's actually become pretty standard in the AMO community. So it's possible to coherently transfer a pair of atoms to a weakly bound molecular state, and then all the way to the absolute molecular bound, ground state, the most strongly bound state, uh, without heating the, the sample of atoms. Uh, so typically, you can start with temperatures of order 100 nanokelvin for atoms, and then using this two-step procedure, form molecules at the same temperature. Uh, and the internal state temperature is also extremely low. These coherent processes address single quantum states. Um, so this, this has now been done by over a dozen groups. Uh, as I mentioned just last week, the first Bose-Einstein condensate of polar molecules was created using this sort of technique. Um, and it works great as long as you use molecules that consist of two different alkali atoms, like potassium rubidium or sodium rubidium or... or Lithium sodium. Uh, and you know, these, these are really remarkable techniques that are pushing, pushing in lots of interesting new directions. Um, for example, you know, first studies of strongly correlated quantum systems with the correlations mediated by electric dipole dipole interactions, uh, very interesting ways of looking at ultra cold chemical reaction dynamics pioneered by Khan Quen, me at Harvard, and so on. But go back to the question that's very interesting for me is, what molecules do you want for a next generation EDM measurement? Um, and OK, so it seems natural to say, why not use these sort of assembled molecules because the techniques work so well? Uh, and actually proposed this to some theorists you know, now 15 years or so ago. And they reported back that the kinds of molecules that seemed feasible to make at the time had really quite modest internal fields because their orbital structure was not correct. Uh, and basically, this looked like it wasn't worth the trouble. So it got abandoned and everybody in the field thought about it until recently, or forgot about it until recently. Um, when you know, we, we returned to this idea, realized that what we really needed was a molecule that had a strong ionic bond, a heavy atom, metal atom, ionically bonded to some other atom. Um, the trouble with the alkalis was always that they, they, don't, uh, they don't bond to each other um, ionically, they bond covalently. So they have the wrong electron orbital structure. Um, but we realized that there is actually one atom that's been laser cooled and trapped that has a very large electron affinity. It's silver, which bizarrely has a structure just like an alkali atom. The only difference is the, the wavelengths are ultraviolet instead of visible or near infrared. Um, but already more than 20 years ago, silver atoms were magnetoropically trapped and cooled, and then not since, because nobody could figure out why they had done that. <laughs> uh, uh, so uh, we also wanted to take advantage of 
uh, a known mechanism to amplify the effect of EDMs of CP violating new physics in particular nuclei that have an octopole deformation. They're basically pear shaped. Um, and there's a small handful of radioactive nuclei where this octopole deformation enhances the CP violating signal, essentially the nuclear EDM, by roughly a factor of a thousand uh, compared to ordinary nuclei. So that's a big enhancement. And if you can use a molecule to get the four orders of magnitude enhancement relative to atoms, and then use one of these nuclei to get another three orders of magnitude enhancement relative to previous experiments, then you're, you're really cooking with fire. Um, and we think that's going to be possible by assembling francium silver molecules, which, you know, if you thought bialkaline molecules sounded insane, then this sounds doubly insane. But we actually think this is eminently doable. Um, so the assembly process is exactly analogous to the process with other bialkalis. And now I forget, eight or 10 different pieces have been made. Uh, so there's every reason to think that'll work. Uh, experiments using these optically or assembled by alkali molecules have already demonstrated very long spin coherence times um, without even trying that hard. Um, the, the particular isotope francium-233 has this big nuclear octopole deformation. Um, now for over 20 years, uh, a group at Triumph in Vancouver has been uh, cooling and trapping francium atoms for different purposes, but the techniques are very well established for doing that. And uh, we realized that we can get the, this particular isotope of francium by buying a heavier isotope that alpha decays to create the francium that we need. And that means that we don't have to rely on, a on an accelerator facility to create the francium. We can just have it come out of a box all the time in, in our labs. So we've now started collaborating with this triumph group who traps and pulls francium uh, to, to try to produce these francium silver molecules. And the idea would be to, when we create these, they should already be at order 100 nanokelvin temperature like in all the other bioalkali experiments. If we put in numbers that only assume that we can do the same that basically all the other bioalkali experiments have done, in terms of molecule numbers, spin coherence time, um, then we anticipate about a factor of a thousand improved sensitivity relative to the current state of the art, uh, which would be quite amazing. Um, so, and with potential for even further improvements in the far future using, for example, spin squeezing techniques or getting to longer coherence times. Um, so we've recently gotten funding from the Moore Foundation for a collaboration working uh, towards making these molecules. It includes some experts in making ultrapole molecules, an ex radio chemist expert to help us not kill ourselves with radioactive actinium, francium trapping and cooling experts, uh, uh, fantastic molecular theorists, Ivana Kodachigova, to think about systematic errors and how to make molecules precisely. Um, and, you know, we're pushing forward on this. We uh, just a couple of months ago made the first silver magneto-optic trap for over 20 years. It basically works just like an alkali atom trap. And we're going to use this, this apparatus to make a BC of silver atoms and understand all its ultra-cold scattering properties. Um, Ultimately, we're, we're, we've started now to, to build this offline francium source, and ultimately, it's going to look sort of like an Apollo-Soyuz experiment, uh, where we have a silver apparatus, a francium apparatus. We bring the silver and francium atoms together, form them into molecules, and then move them to, to a measurement region. So this is a very long-term, multi-year development project, but each of the steps you know, is is very, very similar to things that have been done in other experiments. It's just a matter of getting all the pieces together and collecting all the detailed data about atomic scattering properties that, you know, have been collected for, for a couple of decades now for uh, alkali atoms, but never for silver or for francium. So to give you a sort of takeaway message here, 
this part is showing as a function of time um, the limits on the quark chromoelectric dipole moments, the strong interaction analog of electric dipole moments. Um, and on this scale, the mass of new particles that are being probed uh, by EDM experiments. And again, lots of loopholes and caveats in here. This is a very broad brushstroke picture, but gives you a, a feeling uh, for where things are. So the current state of the art, this mercury EDM experiment and the neutron EDM experiments, the latest versions, are probing uh, mass scales on the order of you know, a few to 10 TeV already. Our Centrex project and, and uh, other, other experiments that are ongoing uh, are projecting to do a factor of a couple better in the EDM corresponding to square root of a couple in the mass scale that's being probed. But our new uh, new francium silver project, we're projecting that you know, really in, in less than ten years we can improve by three orders of magnitude, uh, which would be exciting. And then you know, there's pretty easy to anticipate upgrade paths for this uh, for next generations. And then maybe if we can employ things like spin squeezing for beyond standard quantum limit sensitivity we could push all the way to the background that's predicted in the standard model, at which point this whole game is up because you can't tell if what we're seeing is standard model or in physics. But, you know, that's still six orders of magnitude away. Uh, nevertheless, in my career, you know, until we started making these estimates, the idea of reaching the standard model background for an EDM was unthinkable. And now it's thinkable, you know, it's not, not going to be easy, but I think it's not insane to get here within the next 25 years or so. Okay, so thanks for your attention. I'll stop there and just you know point out that the work I've been telling you about has been done by a really tremendous group of postdocs, uh, first three folks here, grad students, uh, and then now many undergrads working with us on these various projects. Um, and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, do we have any questions? And people on Zoom, um, you can raise your hand or, or do chat as well. When you describe the limits from the mercury experiment, you chose your words very cautiously. You said it's limited on what you can think of as the yeah. why, why do we have caveat? Right. So, in fact, in an atom or molecule, the if a nucleus has an EDM, it will be completely screened by the electrons around it, one hundred percent screened. It's it's not observable. But um, the same CD violating physics that deforms the shape of the nucleus to create an electric dipole moment, which is there, you just can't see it, will also create a, a different deformation of the charge distribution that's called the shift moment, which is obscure, so I try not to go into it. But that shift moment is observable even in the presence of electrons that screen the electric dipole moment. They don't completely screen the shift moment. And that's what these experiments measure. But you can relate the size of that shift moment to, for example, the EDM of the valence nucleon in, in the nucleus. But that's why I was Heading with my language there. Well, well, you don't want to go directly, but you are getting a limit on the electric charge moment. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. For example, with the with the mercury, you actually measure the shift moment, and then you can use that to set a limit on the electric dipole moment in the new process. Yeah. And in our centrist experiment, we'll set a limit on the electric dipole moment. The as far as the theorist is concerned, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I don't know, I find this, this last plot a little easier to grok um, in, by attempting to put all these different kinds of experiments, neutron and, and atom and molecule experiments, on the common, common plot, uh, you, can, you can use some underlying physical mechanism like a quark chroma medium to, to make them easier to compare apples to apples.
of comparing a neutron EDM to a shift moment makes no sense because they have different dimensions. Well, I actually have a couple of questions, depends on the time. Yeah. Um, so, um, I don't quite understand why the by alkaline nuclear nucleus will have much longer uh, the spin coherence, much longer spin coherence time. That's one question. The other question is you talked about spin squeezing, and I want to know what you are planning to do uh -huh. to do it. Yeah, okay. So with regards to the long spin coherence time, so you know it depends what you're comparing to. So for optically trapped atoms, like Turbine atoms, for example, radium atoms. People have demonstrated post over a hundred seconds of nuclear spin coherence time. So it's even better for atoms. But the point I was trying to make was these bioalkaline molecules in my big uh, molecules are going to screw that up because molecules are complicated. But even the first, you know, first attempt to do that, people are already able to demonstrate. You know, more than five seconds in coherence so. so it may or may not be as good as it is in optically packed atoms, but it's demonstrated that it's pretty darn good already. Why your step? Oh, it's essentially that in these bioalkali molecules, including francium silver, the there's an even number of electrons and they pair off into a closed shell. And you know, the optical trapping interacts with the electrons. Uh, but those electrons don't interact with the nuclei very much because they're in closed shells. This is basically a bond or minimal bond shell. So it's it's a decoupling of the nuclear spins from the electronic structure. That's the case. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, was that both your questions? Um, that was one question. Yeah, oh, the still squeezing. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, so it's, you know, there are lots of experiments now that are demonstrating spin squeezing atoms, most of them using similar techniques, uh, engineering interactions between the atoms using optical cabinets, essentially mediating atom-atom interactions with photons that are that are trapped in an optical cabinet. Uh, and those have been quite successful, and those may work for molecules also, but there's been a, an explosion of papers in the last couple of years about using the dipole-dipole interactions between molecules as a resource to engineer squeezing. And that's super attractive for these sorts of experiments where we're, you know, we're planning to have a bunch of polar molecules held in an optical lattice. We'll have to work to keep them from interacting with each other. If we can use the natural interactions as a tool to generate spin squeezing, you know, that would be one of the few times where a molecule makes life easier. Uh, so, you know, but it's totally unexplored. No one's even started experiments to do this. We're, if, if in our experiments with laser cooled and trapped molecules, once we get to a BC, one of the first things we're going to do is try to see if we can create sweet states using the optical doctoral interactions. So you don't need magnetic field to do it. You use optical cavities. Uh, yeah, optical cavities or or even just you know a like standing wave of light coupled with the molecular structure and some control of the molecular states as needed. Thank you. Yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head around the shift moment for a molecule, but the, the, as you said, the, for the mercury case, it's the electron cloud that's distorted. Right. So in the molecule case, is it, say, a heavy molecule, a heavy atom and a light atom, is it the light atom um, cloud that is that is actually part of the distortion? Is it well, not a separate electron cloud anymore? Yeah, so, uh, right. So I first started to be able to understand anything about molecules by using a, a standard sort of conceptual approach, which is thinking about molecular orbitals as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. And you know, the atomic orbitals are a complete basis set, you can always do that. But in molecules that have strong ionic bonds, it's often a good approximation, and it turns out to be true for francium silver that you can think of having francium plus and silver minus, the silver minus basically acts as a local electric field that polarizes the francium plus, uh, which is the closed shell atom. And, and then you can just see, okay, that, that 
silver minus that's a couple of angstroms away creates a much bigger electric field than the 10 kilovolts per centimeter you can use in the mercury experiment. And that's that's the basic idea. So you're talking about the dipole dipole interactions here. Does that affect your ability to do the, you know, alternating the states to make a good differential measurement? That's an excellent question. And you know, that's something that now that we have funding with the theory colleague, we're going to start understanding how much of an issue that is. I mean, it's it's typically easy to fix that by just you know expanding the clouds so the density is lower and the dipole dipole interactions are smaller. But you know, a key question for us is going to be how much do we have to do that? Um, and at this point, we don't really know, um, but we should in the next couple of years know that. Final questions? All right, if not, let's thank Dave again.